Oh. Hello everyone. <laughs> Hi. Hello everyone. Hi. Um, my name is Zaina and I'm one of the nine curators from Unquiet Moments Capturing the Everyday. We're so excited to welcome you all uh, to the second event in our public programme, which is part of the Court Building Somerset House Collaborative Digital Programme supported by Morgan Stanley. We hope everyone has had a chance to view the exhibition, uh, which is dedicated to the act of recording the everyday through the making of art. Unquiet Moments was initially conceived in response to a chapter of Somerset House's history as the site of the public register of births, deaths and marriages. Yet our exhibition seeks to explore the moments between these recognised rites of passage, the routines and rhythms of daily life that make up our personal and collective histories. Cumulatively, the works of art included in Unquiet Moments position the everyday as a site of joy and sorrow, resistance and resilience. We've often thought of this exhibition as an alternative form of archive, one that draws attention to the diversity of everyday life as experienced across time and place. Reflecting upon our original brief for this project, the traditional archive situated at Somerset House felt somewhat restrictive in its content, not only in its privileging of certain moments or events, but also the categorization of individuals and relationships included therein. Such questions surrounding inclusion and visibility, both within the public sphere and cultural production, are a recurring interest of our guests this evening. Sunil Gupta has been involved in independent photography as a critical practice for many years and focuses on issues of race, migration and queerness. He is a professorial fellow at UCA Farnham and a visiting tutor at the Royal College of Art in London. His recent solo exhibitions include Descent and Desire with Charan Singh at the Contemporary Museum of Art in Houston and the Kochi Mazuris Biennial in Kochi next year. So next year, Sunil's work will, um, will be the subject of retrospective at the Photographer's Gallery in London and the Ryerson Image Centre in Toronto. He's been included in countless group exhibitions, including Masculinity's Liberation Through Photography, which is on display at the Barbican Art Gallery this year. Four photographs from Sunil's series Exiles are included within the Family Albums and Community Portraits section of Unquiet Moments, which highlights how works of art can powerfully articulate the collective identity of communities. Fiona Anderson is an art historian and senior lecturer at Newcastle University who specialises in modern and contemporary art. Her work explores LGBTQ social and sexual cultures and art from the 1970s to the present, with a particular interest in practices of gentrification and preservation, queer world making and the politics of urban space. From 2016 to 2019, she was the UK principal investigator for Cruising the 70s, unearthing pre-HIV and AIDS queer sexual cultures, a pan-European collaborative research project that explored LGBTQ social and sexual cultures of the 1970s and their significance for LGBTQ people and queer art making practices across Europe now and in the future. I'd just like to thank Sunil and Fiona so much for joining us this evening. Please feel free to submit your questions and they'll answer as many as possible following the discussion. I'd just like everyone uh, to be made aware that some of the images that we'll discuss this evening will contain full frontal nudity. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass over to Sunil and Fiona for what I'm sure is going to be an absolutely fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Zaina. Um, I thought it'd be useful just to um, say that so, so Sunil and I will talk for about an hour and then there'll be an opportunity for questions. So please do submit those. Um, through the, the various streams. Um, and also I thought it would be uh, useful to say too that Sunil and I will be talking about some of, uh, sort of some of his work and then some of the things that we've worked on um, together, not, not including, it's interesting to see that we look, we look like both members of the uh, Keith Herring canine yeah. <laughs> fan club yeah. here, <laughs> but we have an additional um, working relationship too. So we'll talk about that also. Um, I thought it would be interesting to start, um, actually before we get to, to exiles, but actually to consider the current moment. And I'm interested in how uh, COVID and the lockdown has impacted your working life, Sunil. Well, it started as a, as a welcome holiday. I thought, great. Uh, my normal lifestyle anyway is to be in this space. I live in work in this lockdown studio place in Camberwell. And I only leave it if I have to. So then I didn't have to. And I thought, wonderful, I just have a, uh, lovely naps and long lunches. And so that did happen for a while. And then suddenly it got busier and busier. And then it's become 
altogether too busy. Um, so I don't know what happened. Everyone got suddenly super active or and wants to have Zoom meetings like, I was going to say like this, but I've been on the computer all day like this almost. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I can't wait to get my nap in. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so let's talk a bit about uh, Exiles first, the work that's in this exhibition. So four photographs from the series are included in this show. Um, could you tell us a bit about how the commission for the series came about? Well, uh, they were planning the photographer's gallery who did the commissioning and the curator there, uh, Alex Noble, Alexander Noble, had this idea to do an exhibition uh, that ended up being called Body Politics, but that was kind of looking at the feminist days mm -hmm. uh, at the body, you know, because uh, you can think back to those days, which were the mid 80s. Mm -hmm. There was something called difference theory, it was kind of fashionable of people coming out of, at that point from art and photography courses. Uh, so there was a lot of interest in psychoanalysis and Lacanian ways of viewing things and stuff like that. So it was kind of all largely constructed around those lines. So some work was in existence, like John Copeland's and uh, um, who else was in it? You know, I think uh, Joe Spence and, um, and then some work was commissioned. Uh, I got commissioned and uh, I'm trying to remember whether Alex said or whether I said I want to do India because mm -hmm. <laughs> we were all in London at that point, right? And I had been exploring this question photographically. Uh, what is gay, what is life like for gay men in New Delhi, my hometown? And I'd been passing through there on my way to do other things um, since I left college. and. Um, I proposed I would go back in a more organized way, but I, you know, I'd only been able to knock off a few pictures and it was very fraught and all the rest of it, nothing really had, big had come out of it. So, uh, uh, so it was agreed and a contract was duly signed that I would uh, uh, use the money to uh, make a set of pictures, trying to figure out what it's like for gay men in particular in in Delhi, basically. And mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of how it came about. Um, and I, I didn't stop and think, well, how does this fit into Lacanian theory? Because it doesn't. <laughs> so it was, <gasps> that's the thing. So I was, maybe I, yeah. So I, that's how it came about. And I just, mm -hmm. um, So in addition, I guess, to Lacanians, what sense did you have from the gallery of what, who the audience for the series might be for the exhibition? Oh, well, um, this was maybe 85, 86. Mm -hmm. I was really fired up with gusto around race and representation and more in the post-colonial moment, really, for me. Uh, in 1983 at the RCA, we had a, for the graduation show, a group of us asked the university to give us a space to have a separate black student show, which they did. And so uh, uh, we had that and uh, it just went from there. And basically it was a, where I had an encounter with the GLC, with the town hall people, with the labor party, let's say, or that cultural wing of it. And they were really excited to see what we now call BAME, people who had a fancy MA from the RCA and could speak some kind of art lingo. Mm -hmm. And they just said, come with us. We're taking you off to the South Bank. And I basically turned my back to the art world and to north of the river, everything to do with Cork Street and the West End. They said, no, thank you. And we went to do cultural politics in the GLC. So by the time the show came, I was like deeply immersed in a kind of understanding of uh, the smaller politics and the larger politics of party politics and the making of cultural policy works, how you generate work to generate discussion and put it out there in small places 
because we know the mainstream galleries and the mainstream media won't touch any of it. They, they weren't doing it then anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I wasn't really, uh, so that's what I was inspired by. You know, my mission was that I had been through a British art schooling system five years full time to the MA level. That was all as far as you could go then. I had been completely Eurocentric, no mention of anybody else, only in relation to themselves. So if you said, oh, there's some work happening here, they said, no, that's a, that looks like that's Cindy Sherman. That's just Cindy Sherman happening in Africa or Asia. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like they've already done it. So nothing new could be found, right? Everything had to come from it. That was one thing. And of course, there was no mention of anything gay. It was like this complete silence in my education about it. So there was this tittering, it was weird tittering about it. Mm -hmm. And I remember when Robert Mapletov's show was kind of smuggled into the ICA and it had uh, curtains in front of the pictures and all kinds of like, you know, cloak and daggery kind of stuff like that. It was quite bizarre. I tried to be gay in my college and uh, I got called up for being, for raising the subject with a bunch of kids who were underage, because if you remember, the age of consent in this country used to be 25 or something. So everybody in school was uh, underage, and they were saying, you're proselytizing. Mm -hmm. And that was one of a number of um, queer, like, subjects of queer activism it, through the 80s and 90s. Yeah, you it's... couldn't talk about it anyway. You, know, there was, you weren't allowed to. That mm -hmm. was the thing. Well, I think that it'd be interesting to get on to slightly later the context of section 28 of what comes uh comes to impact your your work your exhibition organizing and your practice um when you after this series um yeah. it's really interesting that you point out or to, to recognize how interconnected uh this gay activism um uh this black uh or organizing uh, coming out of the RCA yeah. and also uh, left-wing politics, how interconnected those three things were and the sort of how that obviously opened up for you, multiple yeah. sort of spaces for collective organizing, for collaborative work, for alternative places to show your, your work beyond Cork Street. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it became my mission to kind of, any opportunity to plant some gay material in a gallery show was my objective. And then if it could be Indian, even better, you mm -hmm. know, from my point of view, because I have seen no art history, art historical references to gay Indian men anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I was determined to put some there. And uh, it became a kind of uh, battle cry. Mm -hmm. And I think all this other stuff you just mentioned, uh, the race thing and uh, Labour Party thing and the, everybody's opposition to Thatcher. We had a wonderful enemy in Margaret Thatcher. She was perfect. I miss those days almost. <laughs> and chanting, you know, outside Downing Street and all that. So, um, you know, I think it all sort of seemed to happen, if I can say, very naturally. I didn't really seek it out. It just sort of seemed to be happening around me, you know. So. Um, I mean, like now it's got a label, you know, they say intersectionality, but we weren't saying it then. It just seemed to make sense. One thing we learned through the GLC policymaking thing was that if you give a lot of minorities, such as, you know, like and gays, elderly people, pensioners, disabled people, uh, women, you name it, you know, uh, people who are difficult to hear and whatever, exhibition space to talk about themselves and bring them to things, you know, they, become a huge participating audience mm -hmm. that the West End in the art world really isn't that interested in because mm -hmm. they're interested in something else. Uh, but interestingly, the GLC is broken up around the time that you go to Delhi to research um, this yeah. series. So that's, uh, um, you know, it's evidence of, I think, in part, the, the massive impact that it was having on, um, on marginalized identities and, and minority communities. Could could you tell us a little bit about the research process for Excel? So how um, how you went about researching it before you um, went to India, and then um, your initial research process while you were there? Okay, well, I managed to go to India on student grants from 1980, so I'd been on two or three trips before this. 
not very many. Um, and I'd always been curious about what it's like uh, for gay men. And what I found, generally speaking, is that uh, the, the terminology had arrived. So people would say, I'm gay, and, but not much else. And then generally, the culture was very silent on it. There was no uh, discussion of it in the media, no discussion of it in living rooms. Uh, no organizing around it, no publication, no media about it, like really nothing about it at all. And uh, on top of that, uh, uh, Indian and South Asian culture uh, insists that you get married and a lot of people, and if I had lived there, would have also agreed to go through with it because there's it's hard to imagine the intense, unbelievable pressure from all sides to do this. Also, you don't apparently have to do anything. You just nod your head and say, okay. And the next thing you know, you're married. So uh, what I found was a whole lot of guys uh, were basically married, you know, and who were having a bit of sex on the side. And the side was very brief. It was between work and dinner. Like they had a very small window or if the wife was away, and then parties would take place then in the evenings. And they took place either in the home when the wife was away or in an office, which was slightly more dreary atmosphere, like, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but that was the only venue uh, where, and there was no way to communicate. So it was all word of mouth. So I found it was tenuous, but very extensive. Mm -hmm. So all you needed in Delhi in those days was one phone number and it would pass you on. Mm -hmm. So I got passed on. And then there was the cruising. So basically everybody lived at home with their parents or wives. And home was out of the question. So cruising happened uh, in public spaces, obviously, and that, that start there. But was also the, uh, the sexual acts were concluded there as well, because you couldn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the spaces were functioning both as Spaces needed to be not only where you met somebody briefly, but also where something could happen. So they couldn't be too like out in the open. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also the space that makes it was possible for you to make the work in yeah. as as well, because all the the series all takes place outdoors in public yeah. places. So then I had a kind of I had a few informants, and so I began to do my research first by going to the cruising places as an individual um, uh, participant, meaning I go cruising as well. And I sort of hook up with somebody and I would say, look, I don't really want to have sex, but there's a tape recorder, do you mind talking to me? So <laughs> I collected a bunch of tapes, although some people got really aggressive, they didn't want to talk, you know, they just wanted to either have sex or I just piss off kind of thing. So that was that. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I collected some uh, oral material like that on tape. Uh, and then um, and then meanwhile, I was trying to explain to, and then I also at that point was, had come from this photography training and background wanting to be basically a documentary photographer trying to expose some social justice issue. You know, That was my main reason to be in India was to expose all this huge institutional poverty and the inequalities in the classes and all the rest of it. This was kind of a side thing. And I thought this is not something else I should try and expose in some way. And so initially I did do a tiny bit of documentary work and it immediately threw up this ethical problem as you can guess. So like, how do you document an activity that doesn't want to be seen and remain ethical in some way? Mm -hmm. And, and the, the exposure time, of which creates yeah. creates legal problems as well, because I think it would be well, interesting to say a bit really about the, the worrying one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they were illegal for them. That's true. You mm -hmm. could land them in prison. They're the, you know, the criminal offense. That's right. Mm -hmm. In the Indian penal code. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, which if we need to remind ourselves came from here. So thanks to lovely Lord Macaulay. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, um, yeah. Uh, it's colonial legislative hangover. The British policy, they've all got it, Uganda, Malaysia, everybody's got the same wording. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And 
Before we talk about one of the images in more detail, could you say a bit about the title and the motivation for the title as well? Well, it was kind of personal. So I thought given this really heavy pressure, um, um, so um, the only way to deal with it was to be in a kind of exile. So which you could do internally, if you remain there, you kind of withdraw your, you can keep your lifestyle just so secret that it's like you don't exist. Mm -hmm. Or like in my case, I chose to like not live there anymore. Mm -hmm. I could have chosen to go back uh, because remember I'd come out from this, with this fancy MA and uh, people like the sound of it. And they said, ah, maybe you want to come and do something, teach or do something here. We have the odd course. And I flirted with that. Um, but then I realized I couldn't live, I, I couldn't have lived uh, in this completely hidden kind of way, you know. Mm -hmm. Since I was in encountered gay liberation at 17, I was like, rah, rah, you know, gay lib was my uh, bread and butter and my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. uh, you and know, you experienced that in Montreal, not in Delhi. Yeah. 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 So there was no way I could have lived there. So exile. So then I feel like I've had to live here. Uh, because I couldn't live there in a kind of exile. Mm -hmm. How long did you spend in India working on the series? Well, I had a kind of a, cal a 12 month period from start to finish, but I uh, was able to go back and forth a couple of times because uh, the other problem I was having is that uh, uh, I was trying to explain to the subjects, because I found this small, social network to work with them because then we were going to and they were my informants and my actors and uh, but then I couldn't explain to anybody uh, also what I was trying to do you know first there was they didn't quite understand what I used to say to them you don't understand what gay is I don't think you're gay I used to go around telling them they weren't gay because they were married and they were a bit pretty you know not just heteronormative they were hetero they were just having a boy on the side, like now and then. I didn't think that made anybody gay, and I have to tell them that. So it, <laughs> then they didn't know what the hell I was, why I want to take pictures of this. Like, so, so in India at the time, there was no photography in the art world. There was no photography in galleries. The only photography that there was was in either editorial in print or advertising in print. And there was a ton of that, loads of print media. But so they couldn't see, and so then I was trying to educate them as well. I'm doing a mission, so I, and this whole ethical thing, so I would take, I would shoot film in Delhi, come back to London, process contact sheets, go back to Delhi, show the people, this is what you look like, you know, like, uh, what do you think, should we use this one or that one, and stuff like that. So um, as far as I could, I tried to involve them, you know, in my, trying to be like super ethical, but I, I guess they kind of took my word for it a bit because they had no way to. They did have a proviso though that uh, I'm not to show them in, in India or in Delhi. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't be shown there. They were only for, to be shown here. Mm -hmm. Because again, before the internet, it really meant that they were invisible to everybody there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. Could you share your screen and we can see one of the images and talk about it? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Hang on, I lost my cursor for some reason. Why am I done that? Oh, it's back. It so, so Sunil and I picked one image from the series each, and the first one is his um, that we wanted to oh. talk about. Oh, okay, it's back again. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry, that's the poster. There we go. Hmm. So I guess we've talked quite a lot about how the series came about. I think it'd be really interesting to talk a bit more about the composition, the relationship between the figures, and we can also talk about the these architectural, historically significant settings as well. Um, could you say a wee bit about the, 
this composition and how these two figures are relating to each other. Um, I mean, there's clearly some ethical um, motivations for having this figure closest to us with, with his back to us. Okay, so uh, basically we're looking at this scene. It's a Mughal emperor's tomb, Homayu, and it's a prototype for the Taj Mahal. It's uh, a completely symmetrical building and what surrounds it and the gardens that surround it. And I wanted to keep that symmetry and it worked well with the square. And I planted uh, my protagonist, if you like, dead in the middle of it almost, uh, die with the ball there. Uh, and of course he has his back to us because very few people were willing to uh, show their faces. Um, now this particular picture is interesting for uh, another reason, or for several reasons. So very quickly, first of all, I grew up right next to this place. So uh, this was my childhood playground, believe it or not. And it was it's been a big, used to be a very heavily used cruising area because there weren't many people there. I was open to the public. Uh, it's now very controlled, so that's not possible. It's also, uh, this, it's also a building that's been much photographed in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. So we have a kind of history of photography a colonial history of photography where Europeans come and take pictures in India and they take pictures of buildings like this. And I guess because of the shutter speeds and such like, there are never any people in them. And I want to also to remind us that that was part of the problem of that 19th century work, that the people seem to be of no interest and don't appear anywhere. Uh, so there was uh, that kind of aspect to it. Uh, and then uh, the other thing was um, AIDS had appeared in the West and in India, not really, but uh, little bits of news was coming. Remember this is 1986, right? 87. Little bit of news was coming through uh, visitors. And in this case, there's an American. So the other thing I wanted to do in this body of work was because it was going to be shown in the West. And I had a feeling that if everybody's Indian in all of the pictures, what's a white audience going to make of it? It's going to look like there's a lot of Indians in India doing that kind of thing. You know, what does it matter to me? So I wanted to bring in the West or some kind of white figure. And uh, so he makes an appearance just in this picture, mm -hmm. bringing this news about AIDS and condoms. But of course, nobody believes him, which mm -hmm. is pretty much what was happening at the time. Um, and it's set up in the image, kind of like it has a cruisy quality to it, The um, this figure yeah, walking that, past in this kind of cruising ground. Yes, that's very much also in that Indian manner of, of people stare at you in India. I don't have a beam, but complete strangers just stand there like that and just stare at you. <laughs> so it's some, I think you come from outside, you can't always tell if they're cruising. I you think they're all cruising. I think sometimes they're just staring at you. But anyway, yeah, so there's that element of the gaze. And uh, oh, before we leave this picture, I just wanted to point out a colon another colonial aspect. Mm -hmm. It just came to my mind because I, I went back to look at some of the uh, very earliest pictures or images or drawings of this space. and. The Mughals had uh, Indian, North Indian culture had a lot of planting. So this lawn idea, the grass, that's the British, the, the British created this grass idea. They chopped down all the bushes and made these lovely lawns everywhere, which are impossible to keep up anyway. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that's how this one came about. I think it'd be interesting to say a bit more about the significance of depicting these Men. So it's not just this image, it's across the series as a whole, insights of historical significance, like I say, particularly ones that might be depicted in 19th century colonial uh, photographs, because I'm really interested in the relationship, say, to, of this one to, to the photograph with the, the building that says Indira's vision yeah. uh, on it. I'm not sure where that is, but um, the, this series was taken two, three years after Indira Gandhi was assassinated. I'm kind of interested in how these sites work. You know, they're like tools of nation building and that, 
the relationship of that to the title exiles as well and this idea of the um, prohibition of homosexuality as this colonial um, a colonial prohibition in, in the Indian penal code. Um, so I suppose that's a question about the relationship between public and private in these works and how that fits with the idea of, of um, post-colonial nation building. Yeah, okay. Uh, so that picture, that building was actually uh, a constructed building, modern construction. Uh, it was it's part of a big exhibition center, like a NEC type place, uh, which is used for trade shows. But I liked it and it was my, uh, I've always had a kind of informal sequential series narrative because um, there's a kind of little bit of a plot line running through the 12, 13 pictures. That, mm -hmm. that was always the first one. It was a scene setting one because you had the state. And then uh, I don't know if you probably, you can remember the picture. Uh, there's this very feminine dome-like figure. India's full of domes, by the way, very feminine architecture. So unlike here, which everything is shooting up straight. Uh, so uh, what was I saying? Yeah, so then there's this, our, our guys are standing in the foreground, but between them and the building is a father being trailed by a mom and uh, three or four children. It's the Indian family. Mm -hmm. And I, so I feel like we're outside and we're looking at them and they're outside and they're looking at the Indian family and they're outside of that. And they're also looking at the state, uh, which is refusing to recognize who they are. Mm -hmm. So that was, mm -hmm. that was what that one was about. Yeah. Um, shall we talk about the next photograph? Yeah, yeah. Ah, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> This is a class one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's a it's a few things. Uh, I, cause it, the composition, the setting is quite different because you've got the, this uh, site of you know clearly of historical um, significance kind of presence, but this the composition is much closer, and the relationship between the figures I think is much more er erotic, er erotic really. Um, I think that's partly why I was I was drawn to it, but I was also interested in the text and what it suggests about kind of class dynamics in queer life in Delhi in this period. Yeah, so this one, uh, uh, we, uh, we they, the subjects have dressed in this manner for the photograph. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, you see, in India, it's very acceptable to be dressed either in Indian dress or in Western dress, but they, they can act as signifiers. So, uh, so here it's acting in an ambiguous way, in the sense that normally you would think of the Western dress as being more elite or more upwardly mobile compared to the Indian dress. Uh, if you go to a middle class, upper middle class home, you find often that the help would be in Indian dress and the, uh, and the, uh, the family would not be. Uh, but actually, I've reversed it here, which also happens. So here we have uh, uh, something like, I guess maybe this is a little bit too ambiguous. So we have the uh, the more upper class person is standing up more in a position of authority. Mm -hmm. And we're not sure if he's meeting his fellow's gaze, but the, the one looking up is the more subaltern character in this image, although he's dressed in the jeans, but he's wearing them in, he's wearing kind of aspirational jeans because real elite people would be in Levi's. This is some kind of local knockoff. So he's also looking up for approval. You know, he's, he's being a little bit subordinate. Uh, yeah, it's sexual also. They're trying to get closer together. Mm -hmm. uh, so they maybe they've met and they're trying to figure out uh, what the deal is going to be, um, something like that. Um, 
I saw it as um, the figure looking at the the seated figure looking at the standing figure's crotch yeah. as well. It's interesting the power dynamics in terms of the anonymity of the series because the the more upper class figure as you described him has his face can't be seen at all. No. Definitely not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, but he's very comfortable in his Indian outfit. Uh, so they have no problems uh, with dress that way. Mm -hmm. um, but the issue really struck me coming from my recently from my GLC training <laughs> of accessibility and reaching out and marginalized people to mm -hmm. find in this place, people still talked about the riffraff. So gay people still talked about, the, you know, like they didn't get it, that they did, they had to kind of get over that. And, how would they ever mobilize if they can't talk to half the people in the town? Mm -hmm. So the text um, says the difficulty with organizing a gay group is the question of whether one should include the riffraff. Yeah, but, but the riffraff, on the other hand, is definitely a sexual object. So great interest in sleeping with them, but none whatsoever in having a social evening with them or mm -hmm. inviting them to any kind of um, meeting about uh, trying to set up a movement or anything. Mm -hmm. Their trade. Yeah, yeah, trade. That's, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what to say. We can use jargon, I guess. Yeah. Is, is that jargon? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Coded, know, coded language. Coded language. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah rough, so that's a bit of rough trade. So he could actually, he could, he could beat you up after. He could blackmail you. You know, there were, it's, there was that also. Yeah, there was definitely mm -hmm. an edge, it's an edgy situation. And this is something that I get, you know, was, present in gay life in London at this time as well. And certainly I, th I don't think the gay organizing, even left as gay organizing would be uh, immune from these sort of like class, class dynamics. And yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, since we were talking about the text, I wonder if you could say a bit more about the relationship between text and image in the series, because it feels like that's coming, also coming out of a, um, left-wing political photographic practices that were gathering pace in Britain from the 1970s uh, oh, onwards. True. But it also yeah. gives the series a kind of filmic quality so that there's this sort of script um, snippets, what feel like snippets of conversation that really animate the um, these staged photographs. Could you say yeah. a bit more about your thinking? That, and you do it in other series uh, as well. Yeah. Well, it's partly because I'm a frustrated filmmaker. I came to photography because uh, I was never in a place where I could do film. And uh, I uh, was always interested in the narrative inside and then in between the pictures. And my very earliest work had text underneath, but it was more poetic. So if I can just take us back to 1972 when I was uh, they were part of the early gay liberation stuff in university. It was basically it was a gay society at the university. And my best buddy, who was doing Russian literature, and we both went to see every art movie in the college. I bought a camera and he wrote poetry and we decided to make uh, sequences of what it's like to be single and, and young and gay in our time. And so I would make half a dozen princes scribble under them. But I'd seen this in doing Michael's work in some book it was the only, the very few, it was hard to find any references to anything. Mm -hmm. But I stumbled across to it, my God, aha, he's gay and he's scribbled underneath. I should try this, to this text there. <laughs> and then I came to London and then lo and behold, then there were three perspectives at Big Show at the Hayward. Mm -hmm. And there were all these people using text. And then there were the workshops and the world text was being used. And uh, uh, so I was also had great, uh, was used to having a tape recorder you know, to research things. And uh, actually what I was doing back then was making, the best I could do was make a tape slide. You mm -hmm. should remember from Edinburgh, you know, that was my thing. I would take a bunch of stills and add a soundtrack of some kind. So the sound was always part of it. And uh, so in this case, uh, I felt the pictures alone wouldn't do it the, the thing justice, you know, especially in another context. Um, 
And so uh, I felt it needed this text. And uh, but so this is but the thing is that I constructed this in editing in London after the fact. So my tapes came from all kinds of sources, not from the pictures on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, so not it's not these people saying this exactly. Uh, somebody else is saying it. So I didn't try to marry it up like that. Um, and I just came up with this formal uh, idea that, that we have this thing in the thing in bold is where we are. So it's, sometimes the places are well known, like in the previous picture. This picture too, Lodi Gardens is a a very well-known place of Lodi King, so buried there. Um, and the, the three lines of something little is being said. Um, I became, you know, through the period in London that you're, or in the UK you're talking about of uh, text and image, I also became, and all that political stuff, I became very sensitive to not be a photojournalist. So this is not a caption that you have to walk up to and read in tiny writing. Uh, it, it had to be part of the image. So it, I wanted it to be read from the same viewing distance as the picture. So my text, wherever it appears in my work, is, is part of the image in some way. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so that's why it's a place like that where it is. So you can read it uh, along with the picture. Mm -hmm. And it, I think it challenges that kind of, or... So it also deals with this potential problem of bringing these photographs into this London audience, where, as you say, the, the, you were kind of concerned about how some of these photographs might be of, of gay Indian men might be read by uh, white uh, British yeah. audiences. Um, I'm interested in the idea you described as a staged documentary and how that relates to these discussions about text and an image and this the display of this work in a in a gallery setting yeah uh, so I think somewhere in between uh, uh, I think after I left college I kind of wandered into the London workshops like camera work mm -hmm. and I met a whole um, bunch of people from the other colleges and basically uh, everybody was discussing this issue around ethics and um, you know there'd been this problem with the three perspective show at the Hayward where a lot of uh, class and race issues were covered so there were many images of black people living in council estates and that kind of thing and Asian women demonstrating and all of that but all shocked by white people you know, so uh, like as outsiders, we felt, mm -hmm. you know, so it was lacking something. Um, so anyway, so ethics was becoming an issue in documentary practice, and uh, it seemed to be almost insurmountable, you know. Uh, so uh, this constructed docu documentary style was kind of emerging. Uh, I'm not alone, there are other people who do this. I think I, it kind of happened. Honestly, I think, you know, that some people like to take credit for things, but I think ideas happen at a certain time and they happen to many people at once at around the same time and in different places, but roughly the same time period. Mm -hmm. So uh, this constructed documentary was my solution because I didn't put it in a studio, create it totally from scratch because uh, I wanted it to feel authentic, to have some feeling of authenticity of the place. And, and then I wanted the authenticity of the people. Because whatever you thought of it, there were 12 pictures of Indian homosexual men. And it's, they're undeniably Indian and they're men and they're gay. Like you can, if you don't like it, that was too bad. But now here they were and they'd arrived on, in the gallery scene. And I hoped there would be a kind of stepping stone to something. Mm -hmm. uh, which they weren't for the longest time, actually. <laughs> so I was wrong about that. But they, it, they did arrive, yeah. So how were they received at the time? Because they're coming in, they're, they're being shown in Britain in uh, yeah. where you have, you, you know, you have groups like Camera Work, other, other exhibitions like Same yeah. Difference that you've talked about and a kind of uh, great energy around um, like a politicized, anti-racist, 
queer photographic work. How how was the series received? Well, it was officially kind of in the official response was uh, pretty uh, much of lack of interest. Um, and I think that's partly because of the kind of very uh, Lacanian kind of feminist psychoanalytic take of the show and of many of the reviewers, the series and the reviewers that you think that you'd like to talk about it. And um, I don't think the post-colonial was kind of quite there yet, not in art reviews anyway. And I think it just looked like, well, it's something happening in India. You know, I've come across this elsewhere and people are kind of, it's not in their terms of reference. I think it's, mm-hmm. It's interesting. I think that the idea of being in the the idea of internal exile and uh, exile in one's own mind seems to lend itself very much to a psychoanalytic reading. (laughs) Yeah, I well, they missed it back then. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And where else has this this series been shown? Obviously, it's it's in this exhibition right now. It's in the Arts Council collection. Is that right? Yes, it went there not too long after that, actually. So I, I can't really complain, uh, which is how it got to this show. And then the Arts Council has put it out every now and then. Mm-hmm. So uh, it didn't get shown in its entirety till about 1999, actually in a community show in Southall in West London, which is a South Asian, like Indian, Pakistani, Punjabi neighborhood mm-hmm. near the airport. And they were reopening a local community center as a gallery, come cafe and all that kind of thing. And they, they'd hired this, uh, this uh, woman to run it and all of that. And uh, um, the woman was dating a, a friend of mine. So it turned out they were gay women. So, which, uh, and then they said, well, we got a gallery. We're going to put exiles up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we did. And there was also work by somebody called Follow Me Desai, who some of you might know, uh, uh, who's from London too. Uh, anyway, so there was an opening, and then there was a massive reaction at the opening. Like fights broke out. It's the most exciting opening I've been to. Some people really <laughs> loved it. Uh-huh. Some people really hated it. And some people were adamant that uh, it should be removed. And uh, Unfortunately, they won out. There were serious complaints about it to the council. Um, the show was physically attacked. Uh, the council took down the show, fired the poor woman who, who did hire to run the place. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and um, caved in. And there were some local articles in the press, and they were saying, you know, that we come to live here and our children, you know, learn this dreadful disease over here, you know, and, you know, and want to become homosexuals. And, and it's a total lie that someone should suggest that this happens there because, you know, for India, I think for Indian migrants here, um, home has become, the homeland has become a kind of mythical place where um, stuff like this can't possibly be happening, but we must have learned it here. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting to think how the the historic settings, these monumental settings, kind of amplify yeah. that sense of it happening over there. Um, yeah. yeah. So that happened. So that put uh, another kind of closure on it, you know. So, um, but yeah, it's popped up now and then. Mm-hmm. And, um, I think the tape once put it up. Uh, in some, I forget the context, but one of them, the, the one we saw earlier, mm-hmm. this picture was all on its own on a gigantic wall at the Tate. So that's the most, <laughs> without the text, it just like was this picture. So there's that also, yeah. Mm. It was kind of a little bit out of context. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Could we talk about Mr. Malhotra's party uh, yeah. as, as well? So we're going to uh, skip forward to the early 2000s. Do 
you want to see, shall we talk first or do you want to see it yet? Or well, let's first? let's see it. Yeah. Shall I, oh, okay. Uh, so, so this is a series you made after you returned to live in Delhi in the 2000s. Yeah. Yes, I uh, went to live in 2005. Uh, I came to London because I met a guy and then I went to Delhi because I met another guy. <laughs> <laughs> I read about it in The I... Guardian. <laughs> oh, yeah. 